Okay, why don't we get started? Um, quicker we get started, the quicker we get to the reception uh, and dinner plans, if you have any. Um, so uh, uh, welcome to the uh, Leukemia Committee uh, meeting, uh, 2023 spring meeting. Uh, no, fall. Oh, God. It is 2023, though, right? I got that. <laughs> My name is Harry Erba. I'm the uh, chair of the Leukemia Committee, and I am going to turn over this meeting to Anjali Advani, our uh, vice chair, who has um, really uh, been responsible for getting together this meeting and our closed session this morning. I really appreciate all your help in doing that. So thank you, everyone, for being here, both here in person and online. Uh, so we're going to start um, for the um, agenda today. Uh, the first thing we'll talk about is AML, and we'll focus on Milamatch. Uh, Tara Lynn is going to talk about that. Uh, next, uh, Debbie Stevens is going to give an update on CLL. Uh, Cecilia Young is going to give some translational medicine updates. And then finally, but not least, uh, Kristen O'Dwyer is going to give um, an update on ALL. Uh, so um, we'll go ahead and kick it off with Tara first. Hi there, uh, I'm Tara Lynn, and I am with the Leukemia Program at the University of Kansas. And on behalf of the many, many, many people who have been working on Milamatch um, for many centers across SWOG, as well as the other cooperative groups, um, I'm really excited to present um, an update to everyone. Okay, like, it's just a tiny bit distracting. <laughs> um, well, you guys can see the slides. <laughs> um, a man of many talents, Harry Erba, everybody. <laughs> all right. So Milo Match is the effort um, on behalf of all of the cooperative groups and the NCI um, to really be a big umbrella trial for all newly diagnosed patients with AML and MDS so that we can really start to look at some early efficacy endpoints and, you know, right, especially the explosion in um, molecular targets and diagnostic information and all the new drugs we've seen. Um, it's really an amazing opportunity for us to come together through the cooperative group mechanism um, to be able to really test these drugs and do the kinds of trials um, that wouldn't be available to us through industry alone. Um, this is kind of an overall schema for how it will work um, from the individual sites um, once uh, you have your Milomatch studies up and running. Um, the first part to talk about is what we call the MSRP, the Master Screening and Reassessment Protocol, um, which is led by our team here at SWOG. Um, a diagnostic sample from a new or suspected patient with, ALL, uh, with AML is going to be sent um, for the MSRP screening. And you will get back cytogenetics and NGS information in about 72 hours. And with that information, you'll get a profile on your patient and then an assignment to one of the available Milomatch protocols for induction if there's a protocol that's available for your patient. At the end of induction therapy, another sample is going to be sent and we'll get some MRD information and then that will dictate the next step in the patient's treatment. So, you know, for example, a patient will come in, get consented to the screening and reassessment protocol, and then the tier one protocols are for induction therapy. Then there'll be another reassessment at the end of induction, and then there's going to be a set of tier two flow-based um, MRD assigned protocols for patients who are either uh, to go on to transplant or on to consolidation. The plan would be to have a full suite of tier three protocols for those patients, as well as have coming um, what we call the tier four protocols, um, which are an NDS uh, an NGS validation sub protocol. Protocols that are in the works and very close to, to being ready to go um, are listed here. Um, you can see for high-risk AML patients and for intermediate-risk AML patients, those trials have been written and approved, and we're just waiting sort of for the entire Milomatch program um, to get final approval and be activated. Um, one of the tier two protocols um, 
uh, for MRD positive patients is also awaiting activation and ready to go, whereas other uh, trials for younger patients um, are still in the study uh, design process. When we look at the protocols that are ready to go when Myelomatch launches, the first would be the one for younger patients with high-risk AML. So this would go up to age 59 and use ELN criteria to define patients as high-risk. It'll compare standard seven and three against four investigational arms, seven plus three plus venetoclax, azacitidine venetoclax, CPX351, and CPX351 plus venetoclax. When we look at the trial that's ready to go for intermediate risk patients, it's going to look at standard 7 plus 3 versus 7 plus 3 plus venetoclax versus aza venetoclax. For the MRD positive patients, um, again, you know, this is these are all uh, trials that are coming for younger patients. It's going to look at ARIS-C uh, versus ARIS-C plus venetoclax, CPX351 plus venetoclax, uh, or aza -ven. In terms of the, the, the trials that are going to be coming um, for older patients, you can see buckets here that are led by different of the cooperative groups with the goal to have trials for patients with TP53 mutations, IDH1 and 2 mutations, uh, FLT3 mutations, and then a studies for older patients who don't have um, a targetable mutation at this time. For the older patients, um, the trials um, in blue are further along in development. Uh, for TP53 mutation patients, there's a question that trial was written um, with megrolimab, and we're still waiting to hear um, how that drug is, is going to be moving forward in, in different ways. And then the trial uh, for FLT3 mutation patients is also ready to go. The FLT3 mutation trial uh, that we would be opening will uh, randomize patients to azacitidine venetoclax, Azaven plus gilteritinib given altogether uh, versus Azaven uh, with gilteritinib given in a more stand um, in a more staggered fashion to try to understand, you know, the context of cytopenias and their timing and if there's a way to mitigate that um, in the setting of a triplet for FLT3 positive disease. The TP53 mutation trial um, was designed to look at uh, decitabine and venetoclax, and then the second arm to look at that combination plus megrolimab and we will have to see how that ultimately moves forward. So when we think about what are the benefits to participating in a giant aspirational transformational program like Mylomatch, it's very exciting um, to those of us who have been talking about it for a long time. When you think about it for our patients, right? It's an entryway into this whole family of clinical trials that over time is gonna have studies for all a variety of mutations and at different stages of disease and treatment. And it's really gonna give you a coordinated care path for that patient all the way through, through their induction, through their transplant and whatever else would need to be done. When you think about um, why to open Myelomatch as an enrolling site, obviously it's you know, a little bit of an easier path to activation within your site versus having a pharma trial. It would be virtually impossible to have industry sponsored trials for all of these different subtypes of AML um, and at different stages of disease. And so it really opens up the door uh, for sites to have a much bigger menu of clinical trials available to their patients. Obviously having the rapid turnaround of cytogenetics and NGS within 72 hours is much faster than most of us can get in our centers um, in present day. And so I think this is gonna be um, really amazing and really give us the ability to make decisions about patient treatment much faster, whether it's on a clinical trial because we have an appropriate myelomatch trial for them at that time, or to capture them, right, as part of the myelomatch screening protocol, treat them on standard of care if there's not a trial that's available to them, but still have all of the other myelomatch pieces available to them down the road. And then when we think about the benefits um, to our industry partners, you know, it's, I don't want to say easier, but it's a little bit easier, right, to work through the NCI and the cooperative groups to be able to get more than one, you know, more than one company's drug into a trial, right? We have this amazing time in AML therapy where we have so many new drugs, and it's really only going to be a mechanism like the cooperative groups that can really help us understand how do we use these drugs together in combination? How do we sequence them? When is the right time to do it? And, you know, with kind of the number of sites that we have access to, the number of patients that we can have access to, I really think that a program like Myelomatch is um, really gonna be able to transform the way we take care of AML patients in this country. Thank you.
Bonnie, could you go back to a couple of slides? So I want to uh, thank Tara for that. Uh, she has clearly been drinking the Kool-Aid I've been pouring for the last several years. Um, I, I do want to point out, um, for those of you who are uh, not aware of these numbers that we're putting on this trial, um, so um, actually, why don't you go ahead and do it? Um, explain to them where these numbers are coming from. <laughs> you, you want know, me to? Uh, uh, I could do it. Well, I mean, I can try and yeah. Megan's here, right? She'll, she'll tell me. So, you know, right, we've looked at the statistics from, right, other cooperative No, groups. no, no, not the statistics. Not the, oh, good. <laughs> okay. No, 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 the, 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 how they got the study number. Oh, the study number. So I don't know how they okay. got the study number. Okay, so. well. So to give you an idea, I mean, this has taken quite a few years to get off the ground. I think this was 2021 when we were just spending the whole year figuring out how to name these things. Okay, that's a little facetious. MM, unfortunately, stands for myelomatch, uh, unfortunately, because it's so close to multiple myeloma. And if we get to uh, five or six tiers of therapy, they're going to think that we're the my multiple myeloma group, but we're not. It, this is myelomatch. The um, one is tier one. So it would be tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. The OA stands for older adults. There will be a YA for younger adults. There's um, the MDS. Um, and then the next is, remember, this is an NCTN-wide study in um, uh, a precision medicine initiative. And as Tara said, um, what um, allowed us to get buy-in from all of our colleagues across the NCTN in, in Canada is that groups um, can propose and run trials in Milomatch. So S stands for SWAG and EA, um, you saw on one of them is ECOG Akron, A for Alliance, um, and then there's the uh, uh, CCTG uh, for uh, the Canadians. I don't know if we use all CCTG, but, um, and, then, um, and then the next number is just the number uh, in development. Okay, so this is the second uh, trial um, in development um, uh, for SWAG. Okay. So that's how the numbers, um, uh, come up there. So I thought you might all find that interesting. You, you know, the other, the other thing about this is, um, I agree with Tara, what we're hoping this does, it deconstructs what we do every day in AML therapy, because this is how we think of it now, right? Induction, consolidation, transplant maintenance. And we try to make these um, big conclusions from phase three studies where patients may get all the same induction and then they go off in all different directions to get consolidations at different doses and transplant. And we try to decide what was the benefit of the therapeutic intervention in the first place. Really complicated. So we're not trying to tackle that here. These are signal finding studies, um, smaller, more nimble um, studies, uh, as you heard. Um, so, um, it, but in this, uh, uh, the ability to deconstruct what we're doing here and all of these um, tiers of therapy, it gives us more options, opportunities for our uh, collaborators in, uh, across the NCTN to propose studies and work with the BMT-CTN as well. To get patients, um, we're going to start and we're going to have holes in our portfolio. So core binding factor leukemia, FLT3, uh, NPM1, we are designing studies for those patients but they're not ready to go yet. What I see that we have here with the Canadian uh, study and, and uh, the SWOG study are really the, the truly unmet needs in AML induction. What do you do for these patients without a target who have intermediate risk and definitely for the adverse risk? So if anything, those have been a little bit easier to develop. Some people have thought that those are the boring studies, but we don't have exciting new agents there and, and we continue to argue about what, what agents that we do have would be best there. So I think this is an example of Myelomash uh, trying to sort out, you know, what standard of care therapies out there um, may have a benefit, not only in terms of an early efficacy, but also toxicity um, a standpoint. But as I said, we're going to have all these other uh, areas where we don't have a study. So uh, we got a question this morning, you know, how is this going to be uh uh, different than beat AML, where there was a dropout from the time of screening to going on a study. Well, that took seven seven days um, to to do that assignment. We're going to do it in in three days. But the other thing that's going to prevent us from having a dropout is we thought about this and we have developed into the master screening and assessment um, reassessment protocol a tier advancement protocol. 
So your patient goes on, you get the data back, and they have a FLT3 mutation. You could, you could give them whatever standard of care therapy you want. We're not even going to dictate what standard of care therapy that is. You just have to tell us what they got and what their response was and submit samples. We're going to make it really simple for the sites to keep the patient on. The final point I'll make about this is it's not everything we do as clinical investigators, because unfortunately, as successful as we hope that this is going to be, the fact of the matter is we're going to have plenty of patients who have refractory disease and patients who have relapse disease. And you'll notice that none of that is included in what we're talking about here. This is taking patients from the time of diagnosis and trying our best to give them the uh, longest disease-free survival um, with the least amount of toxicity um, and using all of these parts of the, the menu that we use to treat these patients. And the, there's a reason for that. I mean, not only couldn't we bite off more than we could chew, but also in working with our colleagues across the NCTN, one of the major questions come, came up is, how do you expect us to just you know, drop everything that we're doing in AML clinical research and do this? The reassurance is, unfortunately, I think we're all going to have plenty to do taking care of patients who don't respond or patients who relapse um, along the way. And those studies may feed then back into um, a myelomash. Feed AML may feed back into myelomash. And so it, we really see this as a... Um, uh, uh, a coordinated effort that will be able to use the successes that come out of their treatments that are being developed in relapse refractory AML or in beat AML and bring them into uh, this at an earlier stage. So that's what we're hoping hoping for. Thanks, Tara. I, Rich, I'm going to put you on the spot. I, I'm going to. I would like Rich Little to come up here to the podium. Um, now, he has been instrumental in getting us to where we are today. And I'm not talking about slowing us down. He has been speeding us up. And I want him to tell you um, the timeline of where we are now and when to expect true activation of this monstrosity that we're, we're creating. So, so this is 2023. We verified that. Right? And it's not fall, <laughs> so we, we really do have to get moving. So we really do. So, <clears throat> you know, to reassure everyone, I think that we are finally getting to uh, a point where we're close to activation. And I know we've said this multiple times before, and so I hope it doesn't sound like uh, crying wolf, but um, the most recent interactions with the FDA <clears throat> for the IND and the IDE have been very productive. When we submitted both of those, um, you know, they had a certain period of time, and then we got the dreaded summons for a um, a conference call, a teleconference with the FDA. So I knew that that meant they were putting everything on hold, and that is what happened. And so for the IND, there were a number of things that had to be addressed, um, including a slight redesign in EAO2. That's the study in the older FLT3 group. <clears throat> and some additional data from uh, a phase one study. So we have put all of that together and are, are in the process of compiling that <clears throat> to go back to the FDA uh, for the IND. For the IDE, they said they had safety concerns. And so we, <clears throat> we met with them and, and they told us that our IDE application was in the top five longest applications they had ever received. And we came to realize that was not an accolade. <laughs> um, and um, so we had a very productive meeting with them where they explained some of the things that they wanted and the way they wanted it presented. Luckily, we had already um, generated all the data, and it was um, specific types of analyses on that data that they wanted. And so <clears throat> they assured us if we did these things and resubmitted the application that they would that they would be able to approve it. And so some of the some of the uh, calculations that have had to be done required some complex computer coding to actually generate the mathematics. Um, and so 
the statisticians have been working furiously on that and are nearly complete. We're meeting on Tuesday with the whole laboratory group um, to finalize all of these elements for the IDE. And um, then we will uh, put it into the appropriate uh, formatting for the FDA. And our plan is to submit the IND and the IDE applications back um, uh, within the next two weeks. So by the end of the month, that gives the FDA 30 days to feedback. Um, <clears throat> we would anticipate getting a green light since they have told us exactly what they need and we're responding to that. Uh, the other elements that have to be in place before we activate are we're doing a wet run with real patient samples that is scheduled for the um, end of November where um, these specimens are sent in the kits, myelomatch kits to the various laboratories. The assays are run on all the machines. That data, those data are then inputted in through the automatic uploaders into the matchbox. And then the treatment assignment group will meet to uh, verify the treatment assignments that the matchbox has generated. And so that is scheduled, as I said, for the end of November to make sure that component is working. <clears throat> Another component that uh, needs finalizing is the informatics pieces that tie all the groups together to the NCI um, PMAX system. And so uh, the uh, user acceptance testing is what it's called is scheduled to be completed hopefully December the 15th. Meanwhile, because we've had to make changes and the protocols in response to the IND comments from FDA, the protocols will have to be sort of um, rewritten to um, go back to the central IRB for a final review. And so I think the, you know, the, the most realistic time frame for us to actually launch is after the first of the year in January, um, because you can you get a sense that there is still a final bit of choreography to bring everything together so that we can actually operationalize everything. So it's been a really long, complicated, um, and challenging and exhilarating, particularly when you hear the, the presentation of how you know this is going to ultimately benefit the research and and in turn patients. Uh, I think uh, people ask, ask me over and over again, would you do this again if you knew what you knew now? And I said, absolutely, but hopefully a little better. <laughs> so any questions for Rich? Great, Thank thanks, you. Rich. So, um, you know, yeah, come on up, Deb. So um, as Deb Stevens is coming up, um, so why did I get spring and fall mixed up? Because it was at the spring meeting we said, oh, we should be able to launch pretty quickly. And that's because we thought that all of the all of the assays that we're going to use to get the patients on the first studies that we're going to launch or that we were going to launch um, uh, use flow cytometry to define AML, cytogenetics, and fish. That's that's how you're going to get into the 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 old the intermediate and um, poor risk groups. So we just assumed, since we've been doing this for what fifty years, uh, since seven and three, that this would not require an IDE, but it did, and and that's what we've been working on. Uh, plus the IND for the entire thing. So everything that comes into Milan Patch will be part of one IND. So we're we're really hoping that that th these growing pains would be just that, and it'll get much more efficient over time. But before we move on, uh, you know, in this open session, um, I want to give a uh, shout out, okay, to um, uh, Sharon Palmer, Sarah Cantu. I mean, you've done an amazing job turning things around uh, on a dime with uh, Tara uh, helping you get these answers to the questions from the FDA and revising the protocol. Um, uh, Cecilia, everything that you put into getting the MSRP together, our biostats group with Megan and Anna and Louise, just fantastic. Uh, and everybody has been all in 
to make this happen. Um, and so I really appreciate the effort. Um, and of course, none of this could have happened without uh, Rich's leadership um, uh, of the Milo Match uh, pro uh, program um, and advocating for us at CTEP uh, and the NCI along the way. And of course, all of the people at the NCI and CTEP are patient advocates who have been tireless in, in getting us to this point. So um, hopefully um, when we get to the next spring meeting, and that's what I'm thinking, the spring meeting, mm -hmm. we will be talking about our accrual on Milo Match. Thanks. Hi, I'm Debbie Stevens. I newly transferred to University of North Carolina, and I'm very happy for the opportunity today to give you some updates on the CLL study group activities. And today, my goal is to give you an idea of where the current SWOG studies are throughout the cooperative groups um, and to give you just a little bit of a preview of where we're moving in the future. So the, the current most recent um, cooperative group studies are as follows. Um, as you all likely know, our SWOG study um, is for frontline for all ages of patients with CLL. This is an early intervention study specifically for folks with high risk disease. Um, these are patients who normally would be on the watch and wait group um, and our accrual is ongoing. I'm gonna spend quite a few slides talking some more details about the, uh, our study tonight. Uh, the ECOG Akron group um, completed accrual on their frontline study. This was for patients less than 70 years of age. They were a slightly lower risk subgroup. No deletion 17P was included on this subgroup and they were patients who standardly um, met the criteria for CLL therapy. Uh, there are no updates yet in terms of results. Um, that study, uh, the analysis is still ongoing. The most recent Alliance study was also a frontline study. This one was for older patients with CLL, so 65 years of age or older. It included all risk levels, so high and low risk. Um, again, met standard criteria for CLL therapy. The accrual did complete and they actually made their first presentation at ASCO this year. And I'm gonna be sharing some of the slides with their results tonight. First, I wanna spend a little bit of time um, talking about uh, the study which I chair, the S1925 Evolve study. You can see there, this is a randomized phase three study of early intervention with venetoclax and obinutuzumab versus delayed therapy with venetoclax and obinutuzumab in newly diagnosed asymptomatic high risk patients with CLL. You can see that I have not done any of this work alone and there's lots of people who have contributed to this. Um, and I'm only sorry I didn't put um, Anna and Megan, your names up here, because obviously you, you contributed greatly to the design of this study. In terms of a brief background, of course, right now for asymptomatic CLL patients, the current recommendation is watch and wait. And this is because there've been many prior early intervention studies, mostly done with um, standard chemotherapy drugs like chlorambucil and fludarabine that did not show an overall survival benefit to early intervention. As you all also know, chemotherapy is really no longer routinely used in CLL therapy. And, and so we need some new data on this subject. We just saw the first results of the CLL-12 study, which is a study um, looking at ibrutinib as early intervention. This was just reported at EHA and ICML this year um, by the German CLL study group, and I'm gonna be sharing um, some of their slides as well. So the CLL-12 study design, this was a, a study for newly diagnosed patients with CLL. They were enrolled and a risk assessment was done. And anyone who is deemed not to have any high risk features was, was placed on a watch and wait arm to use as an in-study in control. Anyone who did have increased risk um, was randomized to receive either ibrutinib or placebo. And we had already heard a preliminary report that the primary endpoint analysis did demonstrate superior event-free survival for the ibrutinib group. Uh, but prior to this year, overall survival had not been uh, reported. The final analysis is now uh, approved at a median observation time of about 70 months. I wanted to pick out just a few features looking at specifically that group that was randomized between ibrutinib and placebo on this study, just to point out what I think are a few key features. Um, I did wanna note that, um, again, we've mentioned that uh, deletion 17P is a really high risk subgroup. And uh, really we're only seeing about three to 4% of patients on this study had that high risk subgroup. 
The the second row there, I think, is a very interesting finding. And it, um, any of you who have treated uh, folks who have CLL know that the disease itself is not without side effects. And so you can see that 100% of patients had some sort of um, side effect reported, whether they were on placebo or ibrutinib. Um, kind of even more striking is I, I pulled out the grade three to five toxicity, which are the more severe toxicities. Um, and still 66% of the patients who were randomized to placebo experienced these severe, um, uh, what were deemed to be toxicities. And so, you know, again, it just shows that these patients who are on watch and wait, they do have their own set of symptoms and their quality of life may not be, um, may not be great while on the watch and wait arm. Um, of course, you all know that the BTK inhibitors have some um, key adverse effects that are, are really uh, monitored. And I, so I pulled out bleeding and cardiac arrhythmias, which are known side effects of uh, BTK inhibitors. And these were um, clearly overrepresented in the ibrutinib arm, which was to be expected. This curve shows the progression-free survival and the ibrutinib curve is the, the red curve and you can see a huge separation. Um, you know, I always think of progression-free survival as kind of a funny endpoint in early intervention studies because usually it means the time until you need next treatment while these patients are being treated the whole time. And so anyway, for what it's worth, um, it did show an improvement in progression-free survival. Um, but what was new, uh, newly presented were these overall survival curves. And you can see that the curves are essentially overlapping um, and they don't appear to really be separating at this time. So no difference in overall survival. So the CLL-12 conclusions were that um, as expected, ibrutinib treatment results in some increased side effects, such as increased cardiac arrhythmias and bleeding. Although, you know, notably there were quite a few side effects in the placebo arm. Um, so that's uh, worth mentioning. I, ibrutinib, do, uh, ibrutinib does pro prolong progression-free survival over placebo, but it does not yet approve overall survival. I'm not sure if they're planning on doing any additional analyses um, of this, but you know, at this time point, it's a pretty, you know, pretty unlikely that there will be a difference. Um, and so, this study showed that ibrutinib should not be used as early intervention in this setting. However, we still have a lot of other therapies, time-limited therapies, um, novel therapies are being developed all the time. And so clinical trials are still required for evaluation of proposed intervention, early intervention strategy. So again, should not be done outside of the setting of a clinical trial, but there still are a lot of questions that are unanswered. Kind of moving back to the specific background for the S1925 study, one of the things that we wanted to be sure of is that we were actually reaching the patients who really had the highest risk of, of short survival and short time to needing treatment. And we chose the CLL IPI as a predictor. Um, we like this, um, this uh, classification because it involves both molecular and clinical risk factors. And you can see um, there's a total possible of 10 points here. And you can see the factors, of course, most heavily weighted is deletion 17P and TP53 mutation. If a patient has a CLL IPI score of four or higher, that's considered higher, very high risk. And you can see how the curves separate out here and showing a five-year overall survival rate of about 53% for those with high and only 20% for those with very high um, risk score. Uh, those who have high risk or very high risk, they only have a treatment-free survival of less than 50% at five years. So these are the patients that most likely will need early treatment. So it is a, a, a group of interest for early intervention, and we're hoping we are, again, picking those patients at highest risk of poor outcomes. As I mentioned before, frontline CLL therapy has really shifted from chemoimmunotherapy to targeted therapy. Um, one very popular and very efficacious regimen right now is the combination of venetoclax and obinutuzumab. These um, induce very deep MRD undetectable remissions and was best studied or first studied in the frontline setting in the CLL-14 study, um, where this was given as a limited one year of therapy. This is also distinct from the BTK inhibitors, which are given continuously. And so this is a time-limited therapy. And so it's effective, it's tolerable, and it's time-limited. And so we felt that this would be an optimal regimen to study in early intervention. And the primary question of the S1925 study is, can early intervention with venetoclax and obinutuzumab prolong survival in high-risk patients with CLL? 
I've highlighted a few inclusion criteria here. Um, these the, are the current criteria, and I'm going to highlight where this may change with coming amendments. The diagnosis of CLL has to be made within 12 months of enrollment on the study. They must not require therapy by the current IWCLL guidelines. That means they should be asymptomatic with no cytopenias. They cannot have received prior CLL-directed therapy. They must have a CLL IPI score of four or higher, and or they may have complex cytogenetics, and that is um, defined in this study as three or more cytogenetic abnormalities. Um, ECOG um, score should be zero to two, and no GI malabsorption as venetoclexis an oral drug. Here's the study schema. Again, this is newly diagnosed asymptomatic high-risk patients are currently being enrolled and stratified between high-risk and very high-risk on the CLL IPI score. They're being randomized two to one to early versus delayed therapy with venetoclax and obinutuzumab and receiving a year of therapy as was done on the CLL-14 study. Primary endpoint is overall survival because it's really the only endpoint that will uh, move the needle in this situation. And our accrual goal is for 247 patients. I've listed the secondary endpoints there, including some other efficacy, safety evaluation, some correlative studies looking at minimal residual disease and quality of life. Um, and again, looking at some translational endpoints of minimal residual disease and resistance to therapy. One thing um, that I always suggest that people do as kind of to best increase your chance of patients being in, uh, interested in this study is speaking with these patients at their initial CLL diagnosis. Um, I always do their prognostic studies at our very first visit. And really I, I tell them that we're going to look at these factors. If they have low risk disease, we can um, feel good about doing watch and wait. Um, and fortunately, if you have high risk disease, we may have a study to offer you that looks at um, early intervention with some of our targeted agents. The other thing that's a nice feature for these patients is that venetoclax and obinutuzumab are provided by the study, whether the patients are randomized to early or delayed intervention. So um, it's a nice cost benefit to patients too. I just wanted to highlight that we are planning to shortly submit an amendment, which will extend the time from CLL diagnosis to enrollment from 12 to 18 months. And we hope that that will help um, to speed the enrollment. Uh, we did open this study in December of 2020, which was right during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and so had some slow accrual at the beginning, uh, but this has certainly picked up, and we have um, 78 patients on study now, which is about a third um, of the planned enrollment, and I've just highlighted some of the higher accruing sites here. Um, really um, encourage all of your participation, and there is still plenty of time to open this study and accrue um, to this study. So did you have a question before I go on? You're going to go on? Yes. <laughs> to the next one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I stop you there? Sure. Absolutely. Um, actually, the, the results of the German study make me even more excited about your study because uh, of what you're saying. It's time-limited therapy. We're going to be selecting a very high-risk group of patients. Um, and just watching these patients, they end up having grade three to five toxicities anyways. Um, I am not surprised that the grade one to five toxicities in what turn out to be middle-aged and older adults who are followed by five years. I, I know for the last prior five years, I've had multiple grade one and two <laughs> adverse events occurring to me. Um, so uh, whether there's, uh, thankfully not due to CLL though. Uh, so that's really exciting. Uh, do you have are, are, do you have any idea of um, the patients you have on now uh, the breakdown of their IPI score based on how many are P53? Um, I don't have that, but I've reviewed all of them, and there there's a very large proportion that have TP53 mutation, and are, are mostly, some sites actually don't do TP53 mutation, but they all do deletion 17P, and there's a very high percentage of patients that have that. And actually, I was I was somewhat surprised because when you look at all comers with CLL, it's supposed to be a much smaller percentage that has the very high risk, which is a score of seven or higher. And there are a lot of patients on this study that have a very high risk score. Um, I, I thought it would be very much predominantly in that four to six range, but we are getting very high risk patients, which is what we're, the patients we're really trying to reach. And I, I missed this. If, they, if they're randomized to the late intervention, so when they need therapy, mm -hmm. are the drugs supplied for that group? Yes. 
Mm -hmm. And and I, there are some patients that have been randomized to delayed therapy that have already had to start treatment. Nice. So, well done. Um, and so um, again, we just spent some time reviewing the SWOG study. The ECOG Akron um, current study is not quite ready for any data presentation, but I wanted to spend just a couple of slides highlighting the data that were presented at um, at uh, ASCO this year about the most recent Alliance study. Um, you can see the title of the study here. This is a phase three study of um, ibrutinib, venetoclax, and obinutuzumab. So a three drug combination versus ibrutinib and obinutuzumab for previously untreated older patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, and this study will highlight some of the impact of doing clinical trials during a COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, here's the study schema. Uh, the patients were randomized. What was considered the standard of care arm on this study was ibrutinib and obinutuzumab. Obinutuzumab is given for six months and then ibrutinib is continued indefinitely. Um, the experimental arm was a three drug regimen, uh, again, of the oral pills, ibrutinib and venetoclax uh, paired with obinutuzumab. Um, after, uh, at the end of cycle 14, these patients, if they achieved undetectable MRD status, and a complete remission, so all lymph nodes less than 1.5 centimeters, they could discontinue ibrutinib. If they had any other response, they would continue on ibrutinib. The reason why they presented it at ASCO kind of as an early uh, endpoint is they looked at, their primary endpoint was to improve the progression-free survival um, by adding a, a third drug to this regimen. The three drug regimen is, uh, is highlighted here in blue, and you can see that it did not meet the primary endpoint. It was not better than the standard of care arm, um, just the two drugs, the ibrutinib and obinutuzumab. One reason for this is that there were several patient deaths specifically on the three drug arm secondary to COVID-19. And so when you censor it, there's still no benefit in the three drug arm, but the, the curves look a little bit more overlapping. Um, but I think, you know, of course you can't censor out any side effect you don't want to happen. Um, but it is just, they wanted to highlight this as a marker that really probably adding the venetoclax led to a lot more immune, immune suppression. And, you know, whether it be COVID-19 or some other, you know, heaven forbid we have another pandemic, you know, these patients are more immunosuppressed and it does affect their survival. And so the study was actually the patients who were on the three drug arm still um, were actually given the option to come off of the venetoclax and just finish with the two arm, um, just given that there was no um, a benefit to adding it. I, I'm surprised that you get a hazard ratio of 0 0.8 with those two curves. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the other thing uh, that was notable, I mean, the responses were deeper in the three drug arm. Um, it's kind of a different comparison because as you all know, um, with BTK inhibitors, you often don't get complete remissions. And so it's not surprising that the three drug arm had more complete remissions, which is shown in, in blue here. Uh, also not surprising that adding venetoclax led to more undetectable MRD status. But what was interesting is they showed the progression-free survival curves, and they were actually unchanged whether the patient had detectable MRD versus undetectable MRD, or they had a CR versus not having a CR. And so, you know, we talk a lot about surrogate endpoints um, for these patients, and it, it becomes very difficult when our treatments are just different. Um, and the BTK inhibitors don't lead to these um, very deep remissions at this early time point. Um, and so I thought it was very interesting that there was no difference, at least at this time point, um, based on MRD or um, clinical response. And so in this study, uh, the three drug arm was not superior to ibrutinib and obinutuzumab for the initial treatment of older patients with CLL. And the reason why I specifically highlighted older patients is because the ecog Akron actually is a very similar study, but just looking at the younger patients. And so it will be interesting to see the results of that study because it's possible maybe this group of patients is just too toxic or they just don't need that third drug but it's possible there still could be a benefit in the younger patients. So we'll look forward to seeing those results. Um, of course, um, like many of our studies that were done during this time um, period, COVID-19 may have significantly altered this results. And again, I think that's most likely a result of immune suppression of using the three drugs together. 
Um, and again, I highlighted that the progression-free survival is not impacted by MRD status or response at the end of 12 cycles. And longer-term uh, follow-up of the study will be critical to determine if there are some patients that are benefiting in this group from the three-drug arm. So moving on, I'm just gonna very briefly highlight kind of what's in the works for the CLL groups. Um, a lot of this, um, a lot of the data can't um, be shared in great detail uh, publicly yet, but um, just to give you a highlight, um, in this, uh, in our SWOG group, uh, we are looking at frontline treatment of Richter syndrome, which is a highly unmet need uh, for patients uh, with CLL. Um, this is uh, basically we're kind of at the very first steps of approval and have submitted um, for approval to the SWOG triage committee, um, and you know, assuming that it gets approved, we'll start moving through the the steps. Um, and then ECOG Akron, um, they did share with me their study will be a frontline study. It's going to also be for younger patients, so less than 70 years of age. It will be MRD directed. Um, and they have shared with me that it has been approved by the ECOG Executive Committee and their um, a pending submission to CTAB. So that's moving forward. And then the Alliance study um, is um, is kind of at a similar spot where ours is. It will be for frontline. Again, it will be for older uh, patients with CLL and it's currently under review um, by the Alliance Leukemia Committee. And with that, I will conclude and take any questions. Deb, thank you for uh, your leadership in the working, the SWOG working group and dealing with our colleagues in Alliance and ECOG Akron. I mean, I, I meant collaborating with our colleagues in ECOG and Akron. Hello, thank you uh, for the opportunity to present our data. I'm Cecilia Young. I'm speaking on behalf of the Leukemia Committee and uh, giving some translational medicine updates. Okay, so we're going to start off with uh, the data for va assay validation from the NCI MyeloMatch. Then I'm moving on to a little bit about the assay development for MRD testing in MyeloMatch, and then uh, rounding out with the progress that we're uh, we have in the S1905 study. So this is our molecular oncology laboratory, and on the corner here, you see. See, I see. I can't point over there, but you see Jerry right here, he's holding a dry blood spot card. Um, and so that's that's kind of the fun project in our laboratory. Uh, we do a lot of global oncology testing and that's the spot on CML program. Really cool is that from two of those little dry blood spot, we can get an MR for 0.01% AML, uh, BCR able uh, level. And so that's that's been a really nice program. And the other program we support for global oncology is the Uganda uh, Cancer Molecular Tumor Boards. Uh, where we provide results there. But specifically for SWOG, and I'm not gonna um, go through the entire list of all the studies, but we do do a range of studies from phase one through to phase three, touching on TALL, BALL, CML, and as well as um, AML. For the upcoming, which is what everybody is probably interested in, is the MyeloMatch AML MDS trial. And we also have some in development for MRD studies, and then also uh, another study in ALL. Oh, actually, really important. The five people here in this picture, these are actually the people who does the physical work. While I'm telling you and, and presenting the data, those are the actual hands in the lab that actually generates all of your data. So those are the physical people doing the work. I'm not going to belabor this slide. Tara went through a wonderful talk earlier talking all about MyeloMatch, but I want to um, draw your attention to the big colored arrows. And this is where I'm going to be covering in the next couple of slides here. Um, first, on our validation data for the NCI myeloid assay. And then second, um, a little bit um, kind of a, a preface on what the MRD assay is going to look like. 
And so the sample workflow and testing menu for tier one from each of your sites, these would be the NCTN trial sites from your site. And what would happen is we would ask for a core biopsy as well as a bone marrow aspirate, which will go to your local pathology laboratory for histologic um, characterization and also the confirmation of the AML and the histology. And then we would ask for samples, three tubes of marrow and four tubes of blood to be sent to MDNet Milomatch. And these would be distributed into the biorepository repository into um, the flow cytometry laboratory, and then also for molecular characterization, either at molecular oncology or the MOCA laboratory. And specifically, the NGS um, testing is going to go for your tier one treatment assignment. The NCI myeloid assay is going to be performed on the Genexis ion torrent platform. This is using the AmpliSeq uh, chemistry, which has input of RNA as well as DNA both together in a single assay. It is really rapid because it allows for um, template preparation via isothermal amplification, and also it has semiconductor-based pH sensor sequencing. And that's what allows this ridiculous time frame um, to be very rapid within a day. And let's see, this slide here is a little bit um, heavy but basically, the NCI myeloid assay covers 1,600 DNA hotspots, 800 RNA fusion targets, and it requires only an input of about 14 nanograms of RNA and about 20, about 30 nanograms of DNA. And from that, we're expecting to get um, about 2 million DNA reads and 300 to 500 RNA reads from this. And um, really, this assay was built for capturing most of the AML targets. And it covers about 93% of all of the AML um, mutations we expect to see at about 3%. And the list of genes is here, but I'm not going to cover it in super detail. If you're interested, um, it's, it's right there. And so there's hotspots, there's full genes, and there's also fusions. But what's important, I think, is this little timeline down here is what actually happens in this automated box. There's about an 11 to 12 hour of library preparation, and then about four hours of templating. But really, the sequencing reaction happens in about one and a half hours, and the post-processing is in another half hour. Mm. And then we get the data. And then we can, we can at that point, analyze the data and put this up into a matchbox. But, but isn't that the, I mean, our pathologist tells us that's the hard part getting all that data. I mean, how are you going to turn that around so quickly? So that's the bioinformatics piece of it and the backend piece of it. And so that data analysis and post-processing backend, that's that little half hour right there. Half that, hour. that half hour at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what we are training our clinical variant scientists on doing and also the software um, pipelines after it comes out for variant annotation and interpretation. And so that has all been streamlined. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful process. And actually, this next slide is probably um, these next couple of slides is where the nitty gritty of like working it through the feasibility, the QA, QC, and then all the harmonization where we found out where the holes could be and what the mitigating factors um, are. So um, this is work that really is in conjunction with the MOCA laboratory at, the Fed, at Frederick's, and it's been such an amazing team to work with. Um, so through our feasibility testing, um, there has been, there's three hotspots that I have to say where you're not going to get results on, especially, you know, not in this front part until we revalidate the assay, and these are listed right here. And so we're not going to be reporting on these guys. There's also in our feasibility testing, we found that about 7% of the assays are failing. Um, the samples failed. And so we have to repeat them. But with the 72 hour turnaround time, it's okay. We can still repeat them, you know, the very next day and we still hit our 72 hour turnaround time. So that's okay. We've accounted for that. And we've also in the fusions, there is one fusion, the CAMT2A partial tandem duplication, which requires a slightly higher threshold before we can call, which is what we discovered in the feasibility, and that has moved on through validation. And so these are the, the few things that we've discovered we have to have a little bit more, more stringency on. The harmonization data is in the middle, and this represents over 1,200 
actual specimens. You know, half was done at Mocha, half is done at Fred Hutch, and we pretty much are right on top of each other. So really good concordance through feasibility. We took this through another 163 samples and validation, and there were two discordant cases, which, you know, was really interesting. One patient actually had two mutations in the exact same loci, which is the G12 mutation. And the software forces the program to call one or the other. And so Mocha called one and we called the other. And then the other one that was discrepant was a very low VAF where, you know, you know, we picked up one or Mocha picked up one and the other program basically was a, just a little bit below its threshold cutoff. And so that's pretty, pretty good. And then finally for the FLIP3 ITD, we did everything we could to try to break the assay. And so we went back and um, <laughs> and got uh, 69 archival samples of like really large ITDs, multiple peak ITDs. We took really, really low allelic ratio ITDs, the things that we expected the assay to fail. And we were actually quite surprised. 19 runs and these all passed QC. We missed three really low allelic frequency ITDs, and these are down at 0 0.0007. And the other one we missed, the other two were, they're listed there, which was pretty phenomenal. And the range of ITDs we can pick up is um, 21 to 117 in clinical patients. And we actually had a cell line that was at 126. So we can reliably pick up to about 120 base pairs. Great question. Mm -hmm. This doesn't mean that you're blacklisting all runks one variants, right? No, I, it actually got deleted for some. Uh, oh, okay. yeah. it's, it, there's, a, there's one specific variant okay. in there. <laughs> Otherwise, it's pretty important. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so our validation sample set, we, we went in into the validation after all the feasibility and harmonization um, testing. We went in with 163 unique samples, and this comprises 91 samples of clinical patient samples. Um, and, and just... Just to step back a bit, normally in a clinical laboratory, we don't do this many cases. So don't go back to your own pathology lab and say, well, this is what they did. And don't expect your own pathology lab to do this. <laughs> so, so this is a little overkill. So, you know, there's 91 samples, and of that, that actually covered 1,661 DNA hotspots and uh, almost 800 RNA fusions. And this is a picture of the breadth of uh, fusions and gene mutations that it covers. And so I'm pretty proud of this list because this really recapitulates what we expect to see in AML um, in real life. And so I'm pretty happy with that. We actually went back um, after speaking with the FDA to cover the companion diagnostic markers. So we actually did more in addition um, just to make sure the companion diagnostics were covered pretty well. I'm sorry. So you had on there FLIT3, TKD, and ITD, but you also had just had FLIT3. Mm -hmm. Are these mutations in other places and yep. are they pathogenic? Yes. Okay. So, so not, not in the TKD. Oh, th those rare juxta membrane? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yep. And so this is our validation summary. And so this is specifically MO data, so from our laboratory, but I can tell you that the MOCA data, which um, I, I've seen and have reviewed, looks almost spot on. We have slightly different numbers, but it looks almost the exact same. Very good sensitivity, very good specificity, and also highly accurate and reproducible. If you want the numbers in this list over here are the overall, and then in this table are the breakdown of the SNPs, the indels, the fusions, and then also the overall. So we are doing pretty well on assay performance parameters. And there's also very high precision, especially in the SNP and an indel VAFs. The fusion read counts, while it gives a really um, good yes, no call, the actual read counts is less precise. So I wouldn't use the actual read counts for any kind of measurative qu quantitative um, thing. It would just be a yes, no fusion. And three additional um, experiments we did included a limit of blank, and the spacing's a little weird. I'm sorry about that. But the limit of blank basically helped us assess if there was any background noise in the assay, and there really was no false positives that were detected in basically all the variant classes. The limit of reporting, this helps us identify the accuracy of reporting true positives, and all samples reported at 5% VAFs for SNPs and indels, FLIT3 ITDs, and also fusions. Um, with no issues. 
The limit of detection helps us confirm if 95% of the variants are detected at 1 to 1.5 of the clinical cutoff threshold and 100% call rate at these thresholds, including the uh, companion diagnostic markers. So um, the assay is quite robust. And this is um, uh, something that I've added to show you an example of the MyloMatch report you can expect to receive. And this is an example from the MO laboratory. We have harmonized our report to the MOCA report. And so the two reports should look the same except for the logo. And I wanna walk you through this. You can have the laboratory information of you know which lab issued it. But then the first thing you see are your patient data here. And then the next thing is just the variant details is the first thing you see. Where are the key mutations that are, are identified in your patient sample? And then the other two things you want to pay attention to are the low coverage regions, because we're not expecting every single sample to be absolutely perfect, right? And so if you have a sample that may not have very good coverage in a specific gene, you want to pay attention to that if we called out any low coverage regions, because that potentially could give you a false negative if we don't see a variant and it's in the low coverage region. So I would pay attention to that. And then also the next plot is in the comments because this is where we would mention if we do see a variant that's below the clinical threshold, but we think it's pathogenic and important, that's where we would mention it because it wouldn't be called out here. But we may mention if it's below the 5% threshold or like, hey, wait a minute, we see something, but we, you know, it's not at the portable range. And so those are the things that you may wanna watch out for. The other parts are the biomarker description, assay um, details, and our references. I have a question about that. <clears throat> so when I look at our NGS um, uh, reports coming back, I'm used to seeing the tiers, tiers one through five. And I noticed this doesn't have that, it just has the mutations. So yeah. where's the interpret? How does the site know what might be a VUS versus something real? So we are calling pathogenics. You're what? We're calling pathogenic mutations. Just pathogenic. So you don't even report right. others. Mm -hmm. uh, actionable. Uh, actionable. And if, and if you see something that you think might be germline, do you highlight that? So that will be in the comments. Okay. And right now we are have not decided to call germline. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so the data analysis, informatics, and LIMS, um, Rich already touched on this. This is an ongoing development. We expect to have this. And the goal is to have API capabilities to minimize human error and to really to minimize any kind of actual entering of data. And there is also going to be a new iteration of Genexus software, as well as the automation capabilities. You saw earlier, I mentioned there's about a 7% failure rate. The new ADF, we're hoping, will actually ameliorate some of those errors and um, the failure rates. And so that's coming up in mid-2024, so we'll be um, revalidating at that point. Oh, boy. So I think this is a pretty good assay, um, despite, you know, they've shown you all the holes, but despite all of that, it's been, it's a really good assay. And, and I'm proud to say that um, we have gone through, FDA IDE submission is ongoing and any day now and fingers crossed. So um, going back to the report again, one thing we discussed on, on the Senior Science Council was, is it possible to take this report that's obviously a research report and get it into the patient's medical record? It is a clinical grade report. Ours is clinically validated and it is not a research grade. So what are sites going to do? I mean, because the, at the top, it has all the, the research information. So what does the site have to do then when they get this report to get it into the medical record? So that I am not sure if Matchbox has the capability to unveil yeah. um, the study ID or how to match that back to the patient identifier. So that would be up to the site, then they get the report and they have to put their, they have to put it into the right chart if they're gonna use it and right. identify it in some way. Yeah, I don't know if it's possible to like slap a patient's sticker on top yeah. and double identify it to kind of reconcile the patient identifier and put it back in your EMR. But I think that might be site specific. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for the next, two slides or three slides. I'm going to talk a little bit about the initial development on the um, twin strand myeloid uh, MRD assay. And so this is one of the correlatives that is uh, planned for the future tiers of myelomatch. 
And so you've, we've all seen um, Jerry's talks on uh, duplex sequencing and how it reduces technical noise. Um, the basic premise of duplex sequencing is that it has barcode tags for both sides of a double-stranded DNA. And basically through bioinformatic noise reduction, basically saying if two pieces of DNA, matching DNA have these barcodes, we can go back afterwards and basically cancel out all of the errors that are introduced during PCR and sequencing. And unless a specific mutation is seen in both strands of DNA, it's not a real mutation. And so that's how this ultra error correction happens. And this is how you call a mutation. And so you can theoretically get down to one in 10 million um, reads. And that's, that's, that's this here. Okay. And so the duplex sequencing workflow, it takes a little bit longer. They say about five to seven days, but really library preparation alone takes three days. And then the actual sequencing takes another two days before the data comes out. So about five days before every, all the wet bench stuff is off. And then it takes another couple of days for the informatics to come through and the report to be generated. So really I'm thinking about seven days we to operationalize this. And this is the new panel, the panel two, which has the targets for the 2022 ELN um, guidelines and covering 36 genes with uh, target input, which at the diagnostic assay, they're saying 500 nanograms. For the MRD assay, they're saying 2,000 nanograms. And the reason why 2,000 nanograms, it is all mathematical probability. In order to get greater than 90% of your targets to have a 20,000 depth, um, and that 20,000 depth is really important to reach that MRD depth so that you can call 0.01% um, MRD. That, that's the reason why you need to have that much input. And this is the specific panel that they have developed. And that includes genes with full coverage, as well as genes that just have chunks of it uh, in the hotspot. And so the progress is currently undergoing uh, validation planning and then also um, harmonization with plans with MOCA. So so this stuff hasn't gone into the IDE yet, correct? There, I believe they're still under negotiation with the Lidos contract. Okay. So they're it's still all in planning. <clears throat> And so now at the last few minutes, I'm going to cover our progress on S1905. This is the phase one, two study of OBI3424 in patients with relapse refractory TALL. And as a background for those of you that are unfamiliar with the study, OBI3424 is a novel small molecule drug um, that is activated in cancers that have overexpression of aldoketoreductase 1C3. And the drug uh, molecule is here. And then when there is a lot of AKR1C3 around, it cleaves off the active drug compound right here, which is a DNA cross-linking agent causing cytotoxic effects. And in a couple of studies, they have discovered that TALL in particular have high overexpression of AKR1C3. And so Anjali thought that, hey, this would be a really good uh, drug uh, and a mechanism to treat patients with TALL since there really is no other options for these patients. Good options. And so our translational medicine objective was to treat patients with this drug and to measure MRD and to measure AKR1C3 expression levels. There was an inherent challenge in this because AKR1C3 is a novel biomarker and there really was no assays out there. And so the charge was to develop some um, biomarker assays for it. And so we have since um, developed a several assays, both protein as well as molecular. Um, first, you see here are our molecular development. We developed a peripheral blood as well as a bone marrow assay. And during that development, we actually discovered that AKR1C3 is highly expressed in other progenitors in the marrow, which is really interesting. Um, erythroid progenitors, as well as the erythroid megakaryocyte stem cell actually likely expresses AKR1C3 at high levels. And so it was um, then decided that bone marrow molecular assay for AKR1C3 is not going to be good. As you can see, that doesn't differentiate. Peripheral blood can still be used, 
And then so we developed an IHC marker. And as you can see here, TLL looks pretty good um, for differentiating. And this is basically expression level against percent disease. However, BALL also expresses um, high levels of acar one c 3 in a subset, but it's all over the place. It's not, you know, you can't really predict it. Um, but some cases have high levels, some places has low levels, and some cases just don't have much. And so BALL is less predictable. And then we decided, hey, what if we did a dual immunofluorescence? Can we get better sensitivity and specificity for this assay? And so we developed two assays here, one with ACAR1C3 combined with um, TDT, which is a really good BALL marker, and then our ALL marker, uh, lymphoblast marker. And then the second is looking at ACAR1C3 and CD3. CD3 because it is a more robust marker as compared to TDT. Second is because this can be chromogenic. And then that allows it so that it can be applied to pretty much any immunohistochemistry laboratory across the country. It doesn't require any special immunofluorescence uh, microscope or anything. Um, and so, and it's also a much faster turnaround time. And so that has been developed. This is a normal marrow. And you can see pink is T cell and brown. There are a few, and these are your early erythroid progenitors. And so the correlatives, phase one is now complete and we've um, performed single color IHC on 16 patients and 22 samples. They look great and they've been reported out. The validated assay, we have actually chosen to validate the acar one c 3 cd 3 and that actually has a much higher specificity. Well, not much higher. The single color already had 90%, but this one has 100%. Um, and then we're looking at lowering that um, specificity a little bit if we can lower the thresholds. And so it's kind of always a balance game between how sensitive you can be and, and how much specificity can you play with. Um, but then with that um, very high 100% specificity, we can maintain 100% sensitivity if we cut this threshold off at 20%, which we want to lower that. But here on the bottom here are three examples of the expression patterns we've seen, which is probably another point of correlative exploration. So this first case is an 80% TALL that has very dim CD3. The really bright pink things are just regular T cells. The actual blasts have very dim CD3 and then also has dim AKR1C3. So those kind of like dimish cells in the background, those are all your blasts. The second case in the middle, this one has 70% TALL with dim CD3 and strong AKR1C3, which is why it looks brown. And on higher power, you can see that pink blush. The last case on the end here, this one is a 90% TALL case. It has very strong CD3, but dim AKR1C3, which is why it looks pink. But on higher power, you can actually see the brown expression, which is really cool. So lots of fun with this, um, with this study here. Um, so in conclusion, uh, the MyeloMatch NCI myeloid assay has, is fully validated and has very good assay performance characteristics. Um, the duplex assay is up and coming, and the S1905 correlatives, um, phase one is complete, single color is robust, and the dual IHC has improved specificity over um, that, and we can potentially even lower the call threshold. And I want to make sure I thank everybody um, that has contributed to this work, because I talk about the data, but all the work has been done by everyone else. <laughs> Thank you. It's an amazing amount of work. Two, yes. <laughs> Thank you. 2,000 page IDE. <laughs> I think Tolstoy was a little bit shorter than that, War and Peace. <laughs> 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 That was actually just related um, to um, having to shift the MRD assay um, from Fred Hutch to um, Brent Woods Lab when he moved to UCLA. Um, so it was just a contracting issue that took a little bit. So it's it's back open now. Really amazed that the partnership that you have with Jerry Radish, it says Dr. Jerry Radish Young. Is that hyphenated or? <laughs> it's another spacing issue. The Young uh, is supposed to go on the next line and then the Radish is supposed to go on the next line. <laughs> it's, there's something happened with this. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah, all the spacing's a little off. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Jerry wanted to be here, but he was stuck in Europe at an airport. What is it, Amsterdam? I think. Um. Um. What was that? Yes, and and he's a little concerned about if he'll ever get home because the airport actually has a mortuary on site. So he was wondering how long these delays might be. Um, so uh, hopefully he makes it home okay. If not, um, the the Jerry Radish Young Laboratory is in very good hands, obviously. <laughs> All right, thank Thanks. you. Thanks so much, Cecilia. And Kristen is now going to talk about the updates on ALL. Thanks, everyone. I'm just going to review the protocols and the trials that are being designed within the um, NCTN ALL working group, um, which I have everybody listed here. So I don't have any disclosure. So I thought I would just start since we spent a lot of time talking about AML and other things, uh, just a little brief overview on um, ALL in the US. So it's rare, about 6,600 cases expected this year and um, which makes up a, a very low percentage of the total cancer in the US. But the highest incidence of BALL, as most of you know, is in patients who are younger than 20 years of age. Um, however, the majority of deaths occur in our, in our adults um, older than 55. Um, TAL accounts for about 20 to 30% of all ALL cases. Um, in CLGB10403, they're about the incidence was 28%. And as you know, this is a disease in the young adult population with a higher incidence in males and a modestly higher incidence in black patients. We don't know the risk factors really for ALL, um, except for, of course, Down syndrome, which there's a 20 fold increase over the course of their life, um, and some prior chemo radiation, which <clears throat> the incidence is, is estimated at around three to 7%. And I know I've been seeing a lot of multiple myeloma therapy related ALLs um, in the past few years. Um, and I think that's based on the lenalidomide exposure or the, the suggestion could be that it's some a, that a very specific drug in their regimen. So we are seeing more of that. So historically, we perceive that perhaps TALL had a worse prognosis than um, B, the B phenotype, but two large studies show that it's approximately the same. So the, the survival curve on the right is from E2993, which was a very large intergroup study, more than a thousand patients. Um, and this was a, a traditional adult regimen uh, for our patients. And the 10 year OS was around 37%. The graft on the left is from CLG10403, um, which was a pediatric regimen used for our young adult patients. And you can see that the, well, I have a little bit of formatting issues here too, but those three year OS, um, overall survival curves are similar between the B and the NT lineage. So, but what we do know is that outcome varies by MRD status. So both B and TALL patients had improved disease-free survival in 10403 if they were MRD negative at day 29. Um, the problem was that only approximately 43% of our patients in that trial, and these, again, this was a trial of young adult patients. So presumably the patients in all of the adult population that do better, um, it was the only 43% of patients had undetectable MRD at day 29. So this is sort of what guides our strategies in developing therapies for our adult patients with ALL. Um, the novel agents that we're using, we have um, immune targets. So CD19 with blinitumumab, CD20 with rituximab, 22 with inotuzumab, CD38 is in the in a, an early phase trial for MRD positive ALL and I'll TALL and I'll talk about that. And then of course, it, CAR, CAR T for a relapse BALL and it's in very early um, study of TALL. We're also using the larabine, which is very specific for TALL. And I'll talk about the BH3 memetics, venetoclax and nivitoclax for TALL. And then 
the new data that is emerging for menin inhibitors in our KMT2A arranged ALL. And then the exciting kind of chemotherapy-free regimen of a tyrosine kinase inhibitor and blimtumumab for pH-positive ALL patients. So our active portfolio for BALL is listed here. Um, are, we have <clears throat> three frontline studies that incorporate the majority of our patients. So AO41501 is for our young adult patients aged 18 to 39. This is a randomized phase three trial led by Dan D'Angelo. And this is incorporating the 10403 chemotherapy backbone plus or minus inotuzumab, azogomycin. Um, and I'll talk about I'll talk a little bit more about that in one moment. Then we have A042001, which is also for pH negative ALL, but for older patients, so older than 50. This is a randomized phase two trial of the mini hyper CVD regimen plus inotuzumab, plus or minus inotuzumab. Um, and this is led by Marlies Luskin from the Dana Farber, but was designed um, and by Elias Jabor as well. Um, and then our frontline trial for our pH positive patients is a randomized phase three. It's a trial of TKI induction with chemotherapy, which is the hyper CVAD regimen versus TKI therapy with blenitumumab. And that study is led by Yishai Ofran um, from ECOG, and he is in Israel. So we are thinking about him. Um, and then we have a, a re, we have A041703 led by Matt Wiedewalt. There were two arms to this. There was a relapsed arm, which remains open, but I'll show you some data that was presented at ASCO for the upfront treatment of our older adults. And that was a completely chemotherapy free regimen. And then in TALL, we have two trials that are active. You heard about S1905, but we there is an MRD trial led by Shira Dinner at Northwestern. It is for patients with TALL who are MRD positive. This is a single arm phase two trial adding daratumumab as a mechanism to hopefully clear MRD. So A041501, the frontline trial for young adult patients with pH negative ALL is comparing inotuzumab with our with the backbone chemotherapy regimen. So this trial is currently on hold um, be, for a safety signal that was observed in the experimental arm. So only in the patient in the patients who have received the inotuzumab there were eight or nine deaths in the delayed intensification. So the fourth high dose chemotherapy block, um, patients died due to sepsis. So there was this, in, you know, a, a, sept, a, a toxicity signal that was very late in the regimen. So it takes about eight or nine, eight or nine months, if you have two cycles of vinyl to get to that point. So the trial was put on hold, um, and studied, and now there is an amendment and this is what the proposed amendment is. Um, and it has been submitted to the NCI. But so, so there's two parts to it. For all patients who are MRD negative after course three, which is what we call interim maintenance, and it's a capizi methotrexate course, patients will receive two cycles of blenitumumab on study and then just go to prolonged maintenance. So skipping completely delayed intensification, is that a substitution? I They're still going to get delayed. Intensive. Okay. So it just says that in protocol. Okay. Um, and then this change is recommended based on data that was presented at last year's or this year's ASH um, it, from E1910. And I'll show that data in just a moment. So then the, the biggest part of this amendment is this pilot study that is being um, designed. So patients, all future patients that will be enrolled to this study, if it's allowed to reopen, will be assigned to a reduced dose of inotuzumab and they will not be randomized. So the inotuzumab dose and schedule will be reduced to 0.4 milligrams per meter squared per day. The normal dose, so a day one dose would have, for cycle one would have been 0.8 and then it would be 0.5 and 0.5. It would be delivered, the, the the original trial was written for you, you're treated on days one, eight, and 15. So the total dose per cycle was like one point between one and 1.2. So the new dose that is proposed, you receive two doses of inotuzumab at a reduced dose um, and then re, removing one day. You're not getting it on day eight. So the total dose per cycle is 0 0.8 milligrams per meter. Um, 
And patients will also receive two cycles of blenitumumab prior to starting late intensification. And so again, these are six week cycles and then patients will proceed to um, delayed intensification. And then also during maintenance, the patients who are enrolled to the pilot arm, the dose of mercaptopurine, which is again used daily in maintenance therapy for up to two to three years, will be reduced from 75 milligrams per meter squared to 50 milligrams per meter squared per day. Um, and then you can escalate from there. And also the methyl, the oral methotrexate will be, there's a 50%, uh, excuse me, 50% dose reduction from a stand, a normal dose is 20 milligrams per meter weekly. And this one will begin at 10 milligrams weekly. And then all patients will be encouraged to receive bacterial prophylaxis and consider and, and more substantial use of myeloid growth factor during periods of myelosuppression. Can we talk about this? Yes, for a we can. <laughs> so I, are you sure about that first bullet? Because it looks like for in, if, if they're in M, MRD negative, and I'm assuming that's still flow-based, not clonoseq NGS assay, they'll get two cycles of blenitumab and then proceed. To me, it looks like there is no delayed intensity. Correct. That's what it says in the protocol. That's why I was asking Anjali, because I took it right from... Or if it's maybe it could be maybe I think we need us maybe Rich knows decided to do the delayed intensification. No, I'm gonna say missed it. You know, the, one thing I remember about treating patients on E1910 in, in that trial is there's a lot of courses of chemotherapy. Yeah. Um, unlike just um, you know the 10403 where you have course four where you have two cycles. At two 28 day blocks, and it's really the second 28 day block that's the most myelosuppressive, at least that I've Agreed. seen in my patients. So that that's concerning. It looks like they never mean to give more than two cycles of blenitumab. So does that mean people think you don't need all four cycles? Because that's what was in well, remember, well. So some of these patients may have also received inotuzumab for two cycles, previous. Yeah, but yeah, so you were true. I I understand, but I I think that um you're yeah. So so I I I don't. I, I'm going to say in, yeah in this open session, and my colleagues know that I disagree. I mean, this looks like a completely different study with making huge assumptions, and it, it makes me anxious um uh, about you know what we're doing here, um uh you know with with these changes. I mean, you're getting rid of, you know, what was in, you know, part of 10403, which is our gospel, getting, cutting yeah. down from four cycles to two cycles, which might be fine, but, you know, we don't. So, so I took that from the protocol that was sent. So it could be just oh, we'll a, a merit because yeah. my hunch is that it's, the way that it's written for the the group that is getting the INO, they are going to get, in addition, they are going to get late intensification. So if anybody was going to, if they were going to delete, you know, if they were going to remove or substitute a chemotherapy block with an immunotherapy block, my hunch is that it would have been thought of to do in the patients who we already know that there's potential toxicity signal. So I, if I had to guess. I think it was, yeah. So does this go back to the steering committee or just uh, to CTEP? Rich? So, so, so I think this... Is this so? Yeah. I think this is kind of illustrative of you know you think you have a safe dose of something and you're combining it with something that inotuzumab with something that's already at the kind of limit of toxicity <laughs> backbone. And it was only after 200 and some odd patients were enrolled that the safety signal became evident. And so that I think is a cautionary tale right there. And so. It turns out there were a sufficient number of patients for the phase three to get the primary readout just by stopping and waiting. You have to wait longer because yeah. there are few patients to get the events, but the primary study readout will be available if, if we all we have to do is wait. And so the question is, well, if that were to turn out positive, you can't use that regimen. And so this is just a pilot to find a safer dose. Okay. It's feasibility. It does not in any way impact the primary endpoint of the randomized phase three study. 
It's just sort of a quicker way to do some additional investigation to see if you can combine inotuzumab in this way and bring some blenitumumab in. Okay. okay. So it's feasibility. Thanks. So no, no. So so just to review the E1910 results and why um, it's it's it might be in, important to incorporate the blenitumumab in even to, to all patients. Um, so again, E1910 enrolled 488 patients. Remember, this was the study that during the process of the trial, blenitumumab was approved for patients who were MRD positive. Therefore, the study was redesigned to randomize patients who are MRD negative to receive or not to receive a total of four courses of blenitumumab throughout the consolidation cycles. Um, and this data show, was shown at ASH that adding blenitumumab to the consolidation regimen resulted, if for MRD negative patients, resulted in significantly improved overall survival. Um, and that's important because this tr next trial that I'll talk about, which is led by um, Marlies Luskin and Elias Jabor, A042001, it's a frontline chemotherapy plus blina plus or minus INO for older patients. Initially, it was designed to compare inotuzumab plus mini hyper CVD as, is, is, as is done at MD Anderson to dose and dose adjusted hyper CVAD um, without immune therapy. Um, this is the comparison of the treatment arms as the trial stands now. So patients pending their age um, will receive up to eight courses versus, or four, four total courses um, of, of a, hyper, a mini hyper CVD or a dose adjusted hyper CVAD, um, and then go on to pump maintenance. However, there is an amendment planned for this trial as well, based on the E1910 data that patients should receive in this trial four courses of blinitumumab. Um, that, that amendment has not been approved, I don't think, or it's not active yet, at least. Um, so this is our, the trial for our older adults with Philadelphia chromosome negative. They will get uh, Inotuzumab plus or minus mini hyper CVD courses 1A and, and 2B, then followed by two courses of blina, um, two more courses of the chemo regimen, and then more blina followed by pump maintenance. The primary objectives of this study is undetectable event-free survival of the experimental arm as compared to the standard arm. Um, and the, an event, however, it's defined as a failure to achieve MRD negative CR um, by central multi-parameter flow cytometry after cycle two. Um, if there's an MRD relapse or a hematologic relapse at any time or death from any cause. So it's estimated that the three month event-free survival in the standard arm will be 40% um, and that the three month e EFS in the novel arm will be at least 65%. So. This again, this trial is open, um, and I think it has accrued a, a few patients already. So, um, then I wanted to talk to you about the um, Alliance trial led by Matt Wiedewalt that was um, I know tuzumab induction followed by blenitumumab consolidation for patients older than 60 years. So, he this data was presented at ASCO this year. So, patients received um, an induction course of inotuzumab. If they had cytoreduction, reduction, they went on to receive a second cycle of inotuzumab. If, and the doses of the inotuzumab were 0.5 um, per dose, days 1, 8, and 15. If there was no cytoreduction, reduction, they had an intensification of the dose of inotuzumab to 0 0.8 milligrams per meter squared. And then if they cleared or had some cytoreduction, reduction, course two was blinitumumab for four to five cycles and then follow up, but no, no maintenance therapy. So the composite CR after patients had received just the inotuzumab induction courses was 85%. And then following course two, once patients had received some blinitumumab was 97%. Um, the one-year EFS, this the, this trial did meet its primary endpoint of one, an, a one-year EFS was estimated at 
30% and the one year estimated EFS of the trial was 75% with a one with the one year OS of 84%. So this this trial it, this chemotherapy free regimen appears to be something that is can be done in our older adults and perhaps will be used as a comparator backbone going forward for other trials since it was a small study. Um, so this is our um, upfront trial for our pH positive um, ALL patients. So this, our SWOG lead on this is, uh, is Katie uh, Phelan at Loyola. So this is co um, comparing in a randomized fashion, the hyper CVAD regimen with the investigator's choice of TKI, either disatinib or panatinib to blinitumumab plus investigator's choice of TKI. So either disatinib or panatinib. Um, and then patients will have received again three months, essentially three to four months of therapy before the MRD is performed. Um, there is an opportunity to switch to switch arms if patients on either arm if they have not reached the MRD endpoint. Um, and then um, allos transplant is up to investigator discretion. So this trial is actively enrolling, um, and I think the accrual is quite good for now. And we already talked about S1905, which is Anjali's trial for relapse TALL with the novel compound. Uh, so I won't talk. And then I just wanted to briefly uh, show the scientific rationale for using CD38 as, as a target for MRD in TALL. So David Tichy's lab has demonstrated that CD38 expression is maintained on TALL cells, even after chemotherapy exposure. So looking at cells after a patient has received induction and the, the CD38 is still there at consolidation. Um, and then when he treated these uh then in, in vivo, when he did the patient samples or, or the xenograph model as well, DARA plus DARA plus chemo um, cleared the MRD, um, but there was no, no, significant, no significant difference between the DARA plus the chemo and the DARA. But in, interestingly, the CD38, CD38 expression did not correlate with response. And then there are some very rare case reports of potential clinical efficacy. Um, this is the... Um, patient-derived xenograph model that had a response to DARA. And what was what was interesting about this set of experiments was that it appeared that when mice were treated earlier or with a low disease burden, they had the best responses. Um, it was unclear. There, were, there was a lot of uh, death when there was a very high volume and it was unclear what the cause of that was, if it was just like overwhelming tumor lysis. Um, but the, the idea would be that you get patients in a minimal residual disease state similar to blinitumumab and then try the daratumumab. So that is how, and there has been, there is a relapse refractory phase one trial for daratumumab, mostly in children. Um, and that is ongoing, but the, in the relapse population, there seems to be a pretty good overall response rate um, in both pediatric and young adult patients. So Shira Dinner had from Northwestern has designed this trial using DARA for MRD in TALL. So patients who are in a hematologic CR, uh, but have persistent or recurrent MRD would be eligible. It's a single arm phase one, two trial. The prim primary endpoint is MRD negative rate. And it's, again, it's a small trial with 20, uh, the accrual goal of 20 patients. So patients will um, register and then receive four doses, four weekly doses of daratumumab the investigator can add some chemotherapy to the regimen if needed. Um, and then MRD will be assessed centrally at in Brent Woods lab and patients can either, if they're having a response, can continue on daratumumab or go on to allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, and that brings me to our new concepts for ALL that we're working on. So in BALL, I'll, I'll share with you a trial being designed by um, Ibrahim Aldas and Anjali at S2307. It's the it's adding uh, the KMT2A inhibitor to frontline treatment for our young adult for all ages. Actually, this is a trial that will span the entire age spectrum, or at least that's how it's currently written. Uh, and then trial S2306 is for frontline treatment of TALL um, combining the COG, the children's oncology group regimen that incorporates nilarabine into a 
into their chemotherapy backbone. And then we will be adding venetoclax and nevitoclax. And, I, and this is for patients who are 18 years and, and up. The, the phase one data for the, the concept came from work done um, by in Wendy Stock's lab, combining then and NAV with low dose, low dose chemotherapy and re relapsed and refractory ALL and lymphoblastic lymphoma. Um, and in this trial, the TALL patients had a res had a pretty good response. The, the median number of therapies was approximately four, so a heavily pretreated group with a very poor outcome in relapse disease. And the, the response rate um, was approximately, the, the total CR rate in the TAL patients was around 75%. So um, we're hoping that using this medicine, these medicines in combination earlier on in their treatment therapy might help us get more patients MRD negative. Um, and the reason we think this is because some of the, the BH3 profiling, which is a laboratory technique to understand which BCL2 protein the, the cells depend on for their survival. And so what's different between T and BALL is that in TALL samples, the BCL2 dependence seems to switch from baseline to relapse. So patients are, especially ET, patients with ETPALL are very dependent on BCL2. Um, at the time they were entered into the study, but then through the course of treatment can switch their dependence and, and develop and potentially develop resistance. Whereas in the BLL samples, the, they were BCL, they were more dependent on BCL XL at, at baseline and maintain that throughout their treatment. Um, so we're hoping that if we give these, these medicines earlier on in their treatment, we can eliminate potentially resistant populations and have more patients become MRD negative. So this is the trial. It's a, a randomized phase two. It's a forearm trial. Uh, patients will receive either chemotherapy backbone, chemotherapy backbone plus venetoclax, chemotherapy backbone plus nevitoclax, or chemotherapy plus the combination of venetoclax and nevitoclax. Um, we have two other cohorts. Uh, we have a T lymphoblastic lymphoma cohort that will include 20 patients. The first 10 patients will be treated with the chemotherapy backbone alone because we we really in lymphoblastic lymphoma have little data. These this patient population has typically been excluded from our ALL trials in the adult cooperative groups. So we will treat them, and then the second 10 patients, the, the second cohort of 10 patients will be non-randomly assigned to receive the experimental therapy of VENNAV. And also we have an older cohort, cohort three is for patients who are 40 years and older, for which we have no data using the backbone regimen of the 104 or AALL0434. In this cohort, we will have very specific dose modifications based on their age. So the first 10 patients will be treated for safety. Um, and then the second, the, the, the next 10 patients will be non-randomly assigned to, assigned to receive VENNAV. There will be a safety run-in for this entire protocol, um, especially given the results of A041501 and that very late toxicity signal when you're adding, re adding medicines to an already complicated and long and toxic regimen. So, um, we will follow patient, everybody in the safety cohort will receive the combination, the VEN and the NAV. They'll get, they'll receive the medicines for days one through 14. We're gonna follow patients through delayed intensification for toxicity. Um, and we are going to make some of the similar recommendations with growth factor support and, and antibacterial prophylaxis. And we have decided on our trial to have for the safety run in, this will be open to all sites as long as the investigators are able to attend safety review meetings. Um, yes. How did you know I was going to ask a question? I could tell. <laughs> so um, some TALLs um, will develop IDH mutations. Mm -hmm. Is in polar cats data? Did they look to see? And and those and those um, blasts in AML are so sensitive to metaclax. Is there any correlation here? I don't, I don't know if they've looked at that specifically. I don't know if Anjali might see you know. Yeah, I don't remember seeing that specifically. It's a great question. Yeah. I I think that a lot of the, are they ETP, TLL, that also have the IDH mutation, if I recall? I, I think that they're very early. And I think, yeah. 
Um, I was just wondering. Yeah. It looks like we have a question on the chat. Uh, Dr. Leike said the DARE2 MAB study is a great concept, but the level of MRD of 10 to the negative four is relatively high. Using NGS MRD, we pick up lower levels of MRD and it is hard to ask patients to wait until their MRD level increases to the study threshold. Did you hear that? No, not so much. I, I, Who is it? Who's asking or what? Well, Michaela. Oh, Michaela. Oh, okay. Maybe oh, sorry, Michaela. I'm reading your question. Oh gosh, I don't have my glass. Dare to miss me. Okay, so uh, Dr. Lipke from Stanford is asking, the daratumumab study is a great concept, but the level of MRD of 10 to the minus four is relatively high. Using NGS MRD, we pick up lower levels of MRD and is hard to ask patients to wait until then MRD levels increases to the study threshold. I, I think they may actually be amending that if I remember. I can't remember what the final decision was, um, but I, I believe that they had had some discussion about amending it. And I don't know to what level, kind of getting to what Michaela was saying, um, but I don't know what the final decision was on that. Okay. I could I can ask Brent Wood. He's doing our MRD. And I, I know that at least for the children's oncology group, that was the cut point yeah. that they had been using. So I think they're still going to use that MRD, but I think they may be amending the eligibility to allow some level of clonus. Oh, oh, I, th okay. I think, I think if I remember right. So to allow for more patients yeah. who have, I, so yes, Yes, Michaela, I think they are doing that. And in fact, so they are doing that. And they also, I think, are considering or the, the COG is interested in this and maybe reducing the age. I don't know, Rich is gonna, yeah. this is just what I've heard. So perhaps reducing the age down to 12 years of age to to broaden the people who might have yes. eligibility. Yes, yeah, great point, Michaela. Yes, now I understand your, yes. Most of yeah. us Thank are using the NGS. Yes, testing. yeah. Yep. Yes, so any MRD, any he yes at any time so even like post transplant or something it doesn't have yeah so I don't know if you're you're done if you're going to do the s twenty three oh seven am is that coming up or it is just yes oh, okay. you can ask your question if you no, no no I was just going to say if you didn't have the slides at the AYA committee Dr Aldos presented in, in depth those slides, but I, I mean, yeah, I don't have all of his slides. I just have a couple just to show that yes, the KMT two A, so it's yeah. a rare and a high risk. I can, sub I could send those to you if you want. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll just briefly review. Um, so this is KMT two A rearranged ALL is a, is a high risk subtype on the bar graph. You can see that in, in purple. So the KMT two A, the, the four eleven specifically are in the, the dark purple. So it, this is, a large percentage of infant a ALL, which you can see, but then it really falls off in a in a child. But where you start to see it increase in incidence again, even though it's very rare, is in you know twenty and above. And so this is a high risk subtype. These we have nothing very good. And on the left is is the carry is the OS by carrier type. This is data from the very large E two nine nine three study. Um, here is also, this is data from MD Anderson, their experience with KMT2A and uh, rearrangements. And you can see that the outcomes are quite unsatisfactory with frontline chemotherapy regimens. And even with transplant, there's very high rates uh, of relapse. Um, and it's true, even the MRD negative patients have a very poor outcome. Um, so this is just to review the menin chromatin complex that drives the leuko, uh, you know, the leukemia here, um, and that the KMT two A expression leads to a barren expression of the homeobox genes and their DNA binding cofactor MIS one. So it's thought that this gene expression program causes the hematopoietic differentiation block and the leukemic transformation. So for patients, you know, for leukemias that are driven by KMT two A. Um, and the subsequent transcription of menin, it's a critical oncogenic cofactor. So potentially blocking this interaction could disrupt this assembly and cause then differentiation um, and potential improvement in, in these patients. So 
there was a first in human phase one trial that used um, a specific menin inhibitor, the Revumenin compound or Syndex 5613. Uh, this is an oral and it's it's an oral compound. It is selectively inhibits the menin KMT2A interaction. Um, this was well tolerated in the in the phase one trial, but the main toxicities was a re, was QTC prolongation and differentiation syndrome, which occurred in in a good number of patients. Um, so Ibrahim's trial and that Anjali is also um, a co PI on is using the KMT two A inhibitor, the Revumenin compound with. High to, with the chemotherapy regimen, um, there are three proposed cohorts that the young, you know, the COG will be participating if all, as as it's written currently, um, and so it it's, it spans the entire age spectrum here. So patients one to seventeen, they can they'll have a cohort and they can use. They have slight differences in their. Um, in their backbone chemotherapy, and we will use our 10403 backbone chemotherapy regimen with the Syndex compound. Um, and then for the rare patients that are older, 50, older than 50 with a KMT2A rearranged, um, or uh, uh, I forgot to mention that this trial will also in include acute leukemias of ambiguous lineage. So you don't have to have just ALL, you can have the, um, an ambiguous lineage with, with the KMT2A rearranged um, rearrangement. And MRD assessment is the primary endpoint. And so my, so, yeah. Hi again. So uh, just going back to that uh, study, the, my biggest concern about what we're doing with the menin inhibitors is the potential that menin inhibitors um, do actually cause some myelosuppression. And, you know, if you look at some of the later work that was uh, done uh, up at University of Michigan, actually, with the menin inhibitors. They showed um, that um, in when you give menin inhibitors to to mice, you know, you get very little change in blood counts. But if you go back like three years before oh. that or so, they did a um, competitive transplant experiment where they knocked out menin in uh, one set of uh, stem cells and um, and not in the other, and they could distinguish these stem cells. And then they did uh, um, a competitive <clears throat> transplant, putting mm -hmm. in these cells. And it turned out that um, the hematopoiesis that developed was more likely to be um, from the menin positive cells than the menin negative cells. And so the, the concern is, and, and they conclude this, that under, in periods of time of stress hematopoiesis, mm -hmm. they use mm -hmm. that term, that menin inhibition uh, may actually uh, lead to myelosuppression. Um, and so the reason I bring that up is <clears throat> uh, it's something that as we develop these combinations with uh, revumedim, ziptomedim, and son of, son of those with all the others, um, the timing of when we give a menin inhibitor may turn out to be critical. Um, and, you know, especially um, during inductions when myelos, when the normal um, marrow, normal myeloid cells are suppressed anyways. Um, so just something we're going to have to be on the lookout for as we roll out um, these, these studies. But I'm sure you guys have thought about that. Yeah, so this, um, we have a call actually with CTAP on, on next week. And so I think, um, you know, Ibrahim, uh, Megan, Sharon, all of us have um, kind of talked along with Jen. And um, I don't know if Ibrahim is on the call or not, um, if he's able to speak to this um, probably better than I. But, um, you know, I think what we talked a little bit about is probably we're going to need to do kind of safety run-ins um, with, you um, X number of patients. Um, the second thing was kind of a, adjusting the dosing. Um, and so he's done a really nice job of kind of um, going through and adjusting and altering this. And we'll obviously talk with the steering committee as well, because, um, you know, I think this is something we have to be obviously really careful with. Just from my recollection of the AYA, Dr. Aldos condensed the three arms to two arms and the two arms were uh, up to 49 and then 49 and greater. So I don't know if that's 
has something to do with what Dr. Erba just said? No, I, I think he's maybe because it was an AYA, he just kept it to the yeah. adults I mean, and not to the kids. But So I've but, seen both a three-arm study and a two-arm. Oh, he did condense it? Oh, a lot of adjustment. Oh, it was. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Thank you. You went to a AYA last year. You presented three arms, but at this committee, two arms were yeah. presented. Well, yeah. Yeah. I could be, but I didn't want to bug him. What I forgive me, Abraham, if you're listening, I thought I had the most recent I, schema. But... I think, so I think, Kristen, it's still being discussed, discussed. Um, in the pediatric group. Um, so I think there are a couple of things, you know, what are we going to do kind of in that pediatric group? And then a second question has been, um, you know, with the Blina, it may be easier to study it, but we definitely do want to still look at it in chemo. So kind of taking all those into adjustments. So like Megan said, I think it's still a moving target. Yeah. I, I, I just, I, I just, I, I, I've just been impressed as an investigator on a couple of these studies that um, we're not talking a lot about the myelosuppression that we're seeing mm -hmm. in these patients. And I, I think we have to be open to other designs. I mean, these patients, yes, they have a very poor outcome, but they respond to initial therapy. And so, you know, I, I'm more of a sequencing guy than a combination guy. You know, in older people, they can't tolerate all these drugs together. And so, you know, one way around this would be to give them an induction regimen um, and then, you know, give them um, uh, a, a menin inhibitor with an immunotherapy like blinitumumab um, as a, as a follow-up, as opposed to just sprinkling it into a very intensive chemotherapy regimen already. Just some. Yeah, I, but I, okay. I think that I think with the KMT2A, we do worry about lineage yeah. switching, especially with and with especially with Blina. And then a lot of KMT2A patients, not all, do not express CD22. So then we don't have that. So it's we, it, even in the immune therapy, we're a little we're limited as I, compared to the non-KMT2A. Yeah. As excited as I am yeah. about men inhibitors in this space, I think we're might be jumping a little bit too quickly. Yep. That's all. Yeah. Yep. And Harry, that was the sort of sentiment at CTEP when we reviewed it. And the cautionary tale of the yeah. phase three ALL study, 273 patients in, and you realize you've got the wrong dose of dinatuzumab. Mm. And so this small study would may not reveal that. And then further into development, you find things are derailed. I think it's best to sort of, you know, sort of, you know, regroup and figure out how to how to interdigitate the menin inhibitor in a way to, to so that you can maintain its doses rather than reducing its doses and probably the effectiveness and minimize the combined toxicity of the whole regimen so that when you do get to the more definitive trials, you don't find out at that late point, wow, we went down the wrong path. So I think it's really important to reconsider this one. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and everyone agrees it's an absolutely important thing to do. It's the right, right. thing to do. So no, but I, I, you know, my comment to industry has been the same thing. You know, it, it's sort of like, okay, we got a drug, and now we're going to just combine it. Um, and um, I would much rather see, you know, them uh, do uh, phase one studies with different doses and schedules than just okay, we're going to take three and seven and drop it in, and you know, uh, then Asia and drop it in. Yeah. And I think I just, I did, when I was thinking about how to conclude, I, I definitely think the limits of cytotoxic chemotherapy have been reached in these very prolonged regimens, um, even though we are adding new things. And that also we are doing what CLL is not. We are not doing time limited. What did she say? Like effective, like limited and, and, and tolerable things. We are adding agents to the regimen. I mean, just adding four cycles of blend, right? That's six weeks time. That's 24 weeks to then two, six, two, four, two, and eight weeks of Ino. So you're adding to, you know, a, for a young person, you're adding a lot of, of weeks to a regimen um, that's already three years in duration. So, so it's, it's difficult. Yeah.
we hope, and I know, I, I know a lot of people talk about like substituting these things. People want to go, we think we're, you know, a lot of people think we should just be pulling back a lot of things and just substituting. So anyway. That's Thank you, Kristen. That yeah. was absolutely phenomenal. Wow. Really, really great this review. Is... Really great review Thank you, of everyone. This is I'm just representing everybody on this committee. So thank you for letting me hang out with you all. <laughs> A double rainbow. <laughs> all right. Does anyone else have anything? <laughs> any questions? Anything else to discuss? Sharon, anything else in the chat? No? Well, with that, we thank everyone for all the wonderful presentations and for everyone coming. Thank you.